Listen to this. <laughs> I moved to Los Angeles at 17 and probably from 17 to like all, like way later in life. Um, I listened to you on 105.9. <laughs> you were on the radio station in Los Angeles and you were like a baby. Baby. You still are. But I mean, we were all babies. <laughs> we were all babies, yes. Back then. How did you land that? Did you have to work your way up or how does somebody, especially somebody in journalism, how do they get to get that big of a deal, uh, you that know, young. I don't know if it's a little bit of fate mixed with destiny, mixed with hard work, but when I was in college, I was a psychology major, mm -hmm. communication minor, and you know you have to do internships in order to graduate. I went to USD in San Diego, and I was doing all of these internships in psychology. I was working with at-risk youth, I was working with battered women, mm. I was working with um, Head Start, with young kids, kids on academic probation, and it was so heavy. Mm. It was so heavy, and I couldn't separate. I'm a, I call myself a sensitive person, which I don't apologize for, but I'm a very sensitive person. Me too. And it was a lot for me to separate those two. And did you have to do that because of the psychology class? So that was because of my psychology okay, major. Okay, got it, right? got it, got it. Because okay. I thought I wanted to be a child psychologist. Mm, so mm -hmm. you're, you're basically putting yourself in all these different fields mm -hmm. so that you can understand the different walks of life. So then when a communication, I took a communication class, media, mm -hmm. this media class, and my teacher said, okay, I was getting ready to graduate. He said, you need to do an internship to fulfill your units. And uh, I got into the car and this commercial came on and it said, do you need an internship to graduate? Call now. It was like the very radio voice. So you know? serendipitous. So serendipitous. Uh -huh. So I, I remember like rummaging through my book bag, tearing out a piece of paper and writing down the phone number. I called and I said, oh, I'm, I wanna apply for the internship you have at the radio station. So I went and I did the interview and I got the internship. And I started off as the intern who would go to all the events. I would pump people's gas. You know, we'd give out free gas and put bumper stickers. Uh, and, and you volunteered? Well, it was part of the fulfillment oh, of the internship. Got it, okay. And so the morning show producer approached me one day and he says, you have so much energy, you're very talkative. Do you wanna come answer our phones to fulfill your internship? You know, you get the same credit, but instead of working the late night shifts, you can work the morning shift. And mm -hmm. I was like, yes, perfect. So I was so excited because at the time, the morning show personality, I grew up listening to him on Kiss FM in LA. Mm -hmm. his, name was, his name was Chuck Nasty Man. And so- But what was the name of the show? The morning show at yeah. the time? It was like uh, the something boys. Oh no, that was in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. so this sorry, is, sorry, sorry, sorry. This is San okay. Diego still. San Diego, got yes, it. Yes, this is okay. when I'm still in college. Got so it. I became an internship, I became an intern for that morning show mm -hmm. and I would answer phones and he would call me into the studio every day and he was like, what do college kids, what are you college kids watching right now? Or what do you guys do for fun? And I always had an answer. Mm -hmm. And so after a while, he just became so, I guess, impressed with my personality and I was very much raised that you always show up on time, mm, you yes. do a good job and that helped move me up uh, when I was working there. And so he said, we want to give you your own little segment. It's going to be a 60 second entertainment segment where you're going to do entertainment news. I think he was just kind of trying me out. Yeah. And so I did the entertainment segment and that's when my mom who was in Riverside would drive half an hour just to pick up the signal for 60 seconds to hear me do this. Gotta love parents. This little news segment. So after my internship was up, uh, I was getting ready to graduate and I had become very fascinated with radio and I called my parents and they wanted to hire me as a paid intern now. So I called my parents and I said, I think I wanna stay an extra year in school and double major. I said, this radio thing, I could see myself doing this. Wow. And I talked to my mom about it and my mom said to me, I said, is this, am I abandoning- Is this a pipe dream? Well, yeah. am I abandoning wanting to be a child psychologist to do radio, just- Like it felt a little it less felt a little important selfish. or yeah. superficical. Exactly. Meaningful and connection. Exactly. Yes. And my mom said, she said the most beautiful words. She mm. said, you're helping people in a different way. Oh, she says, you're wow. helping people forget their problems on the way to school, on the way to work. Wow. And it's a different form of therapy. You're laughing every day and wow. you're helping yourself. And I, after she said that, I said, okay, I think I'm going to stay in double major. And my parents were so supportive. And my dad said to me, Miha, he said, this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life. So wow. make sure you love it. Wow. And I stayed an extra year. I double majored. And by the time my... Second year uh, was up, 
you know, uh, my boss at the time said, we want to send you up north to get the green out of you. You're going to go co-host this morning show, and then we're going to bring you back to San Diego. Mm. But before they could bring me back to San Diego, that's when Power 106 in LA called. And I... You just get called? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, here's... I moved to LA at 17. Nobody called me. Well, here, and you know, everyone scared me. They're like, you're going to have to move to Kansas. You're going to have to go do radio over here. And Nasty Man, who I was doing mornings with in San yeah. Diego, his old producer from LA, when I used to listen to him on Kiss FM, uh -huh. was now Big Boy's producer. Wow. Because, you know, the... It's small. It's a it's small, a small world. world. And say they said, we are looking for a female co-host for Big Boy. Mm -hmm. Do you know any? And they were, you know, looking for a Latina. Do you know anyone? And he said, yes. My girl who I just sent, you know, up north, you should contact her. Wow. And it was so funny because I was when I was doing radio up in Salinas, Monterey area, not only was I part of this morning show at the time, but I was also the traffic girl. And you have to understand, in Salinas, there's no traffic. It's the 101 freeway and there's two lanes. So I would literally be saying, in the right-hand lane of traffic, there is a cow and a tumbleweed. And this literally. Is, literally. And this is brought to you by Ralph's. <laughs> like it was so bad. So when I got the call to go to LA and I auditioned, yeah. it was a dream come true. Okay, so now the audition. Do you get nervous at auditions? Or are you just one of those confident types? No, of course you get the, the adrenaline pumping through your mm -hmm. veins. But the one thing I felt really confident when I auditioned for Big Boy's Neighborhood was... That's it, Big Boy's Neighborhood, yeah. I had so much assurance because mm -hmm. I knew that I had a leg up on the competition. Mm -hmm. Because when everyone else was going out drinking in college or having fun, I was showing up at a radio station at 5 a.m. to put in the wow. work. Whoa. I was already in training. Wow. So I knew, and then I had gone up north to go be part of this morning show. Mm -hmm. So I was doing radio every single mm -hmm. day. And I feel like some of the people they were bringing in didn't necessarily right. have that much experience. So I, I mean, and again, I don't know, but I knew I had experience. Yeah, you had the confidence. I, because you had the self-discipline and you, you kind of, when you feel like you earn something, yeah. that, you, that you're, you're just more confident about it. And I don't just wasn't feel like scared. you're a fraud. Yeah, yeah you I got wasn't, confidence. Exactly. I was like, big can throw anything at me and I know how to handle it mm -hmm. because I've been doing this. And how old were you? Oh God, like 21 years old. <laughs> I was so young. I was a baby. So how long did you work on the show? So the Big Boy Neighborhood. So now you're I doing... was on Big Boy's Neighborhood for 10 years. Wow. Yes. Ten years, and while I was there, uh, I and got did you? Okay, so now you're a radio voice. Was it frustrating that people didn't know your face? Well, that's where I got really lucky. Again, my my mom always says she's like, "You were born on a, a lucky star," and sometimes I'm like, "Maybe she was right," because I've had a lot of really amazing breaks. Do um, people get envious of that? Not the people who love me. That's true. But do you have people that don't that I've never feel felt like you've had everything too easy? I've no because people know my work ethic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like I'm coasting either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like I don't know mm -hmm. a lot of people. Stats. Yeah, I don't know a lot of people who are gonna wake up at three, four in the morning mm -hmm. to go do morning radio. Mm -hmm. A lot of people can't hang after a while. No, you're they right. say they want it, and right. then they get there, and, and they don't know. They don't have the stamina, right, or the or the drive or the discipline, right. So you do that for ten years. Now, how do you get your lucky break to go to Access Hollywood? So while I'm in radio, uh, I get a call from this woman at ABC Family, and it was probably a, maybe a year in, two years in, and uh, she says, "Come take a meeting with me." Mm -hmm. And you know, we were in Burbank, and all the major like television, like Disney's there, ABC's there, Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers, yeah. you name it. Yeah. So I go, and again, I'm so nervous because I'm like, what does this lady want? It's ABC family. Uh, I walk in, and she says, who represents you? And I was like, who represents me? It's like, my parents? And she just starts laughing. She says, no, do you have, like, representation? I didn't like even an know. Agent. You an agent. Even I didn't even age. know what that how was. How do you get? How are you born in Riverside? That is this far away from Los Angeles. If it's if it's yeah. not considered yeah. LA, how do you not know? Like, be thinking like that. I, Being an out a Los Angelinian. Be, right. I I think again the the trajectory of my career just it went left. I was right. like I was going to go be a child That's psychologist. Right. That's I'm, right. I'm not You're thinking, thinking industry. No, and I I never had that. I, I just wasn't thinking that way. Right. And so she's humored by she's, you. Yeah. I mean, you're she, endearing to her. That's probably re very refreshing, actually. You know. She was very sweet about it, and she said, mm -hmm. "Look, I want you to meet my friend over at William Morris, 
And Which we'll is see. like one of the biggest. Biggest agencies, yes. That represent every A-list a -list Hollywood celebrity. Correct. Or musician or whoever. But yes. So now you're meeting with William so Morris. I'm, yeah, we're like t the home of Tom Cruise and like Eminem at the time. <laughs> I was just oh, like, okay. Oh my God. So I go and I meet with them and we take this meeting and this woman, Krista, goes, what is your dream job? Uh -huh. And I'm like, my dream job? I'm in LA, This I'm living my dream job. I'm on Big Boy's Neighborhood, this is Market 2. I went from like Market 100 to Market 2 and my mom doesn't have to drive 45 minutes to hear me on the radio. For she 60 can, seconds. For 60 seconds, like I'm talking for four hours now. Like I've made it, you know, yeah. in my mind. Uh, and, and even being from Riverside, you still feel, I very much feel like a small town girl. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a big city, mm -hmm. but I, it's small town. Mm -hmm. And, the sh you know, again, I guess I'm very endearing to a lot of people <laughs> in my naiveness. Uh, and she said, well, if you could have any other dream job, what would it be? And at the time, I worked, uh, MTV TRL was still really big. And I said, MTV, because I loved music. Mm, and she, right. said, she said, okay. So after they signed me, about a month later, they got me an audition. And I met with this woman, uh, woman Wendy McSwain, and we did an audition. And they called me, and they said, you got it. And they said, but here's the kicker. You're going to have to move to New York. Mm. And they said, we're gonna have you do TRL, we're gonna have you do direct effect. And I just thought, wait, what? I have to move to New York? Like, wait, I'm in LA, my family is here, my friends are here, my dream job is here, I'm doing radio in Market 2. I didn't have to end up moving to Kansas or somewhere far to go do radio. Uh, and I said, I can't. And she said, well then we're gonna have to pull the job. And we hung up. How old are you at this point? Probably now like 23, 23 How years old. How do you have the confidence at 23 years old to pass on this opportunity? It just, something, I don't know. You just I, always I just trusted yourself. I trusted myself and I just thought, I'm gonna go move to this big city in New York where, and to have to give up this was a golden opportunity right. to okay, be so in Okay, so I get it. You LA. already had your golden ticket. Your dream job is what you told her. Yeah. I, I mean, get it. I can understand the logic now. It's, okay. it's a little tough when you're building a name for yourself yeah. on L.A. radio yeah. and your family's there, too. Yeah. You know, family's yeah. a big component for no, me. No, it's hard. If you can make it in L.A., I mean, that's saying yeah. something. Okay, so she, you pass I on pass the on job. the job. I cried. I cried for like a week. Because it, it felt heartbreaking. Totally. It felt like someone, it's right here, yeah. and then it just gets ripped yeah, away. Yeah, and why is it always that you have the two things at one time? When it rains, it pours. I know, <laughs> I know. And then there's drought, and you're like, ah. Right. Okay, so you pass on that. So I pass with... on that, but then she calls me back in two, after two weeks, and she said, look, we've decided that we don't want to let you go, and wow. we are going to make you our first L.A. correspondent. And so you'll travel, you'll be bi-coastal. We'll need you to come to New York. You'll mm -hmm. come do the MTV Awards. You'll come do TRL. You'll come do Direct Effect. Whoa. They created this show Whoa. that I was doing. Um, and then you'll also cover events that are happening in LA. Wow. And we're launching this MTV Latin, like the Latin uh, MTV, mm, mm. and you'll host that as well. Mm -hmm. So they were finding vehicles in order, you know, I think a lot of things were bubbling for them at the time. And so it was a dream come true. It was like, I got to do LA radio and I got to do MTV. Uh, so you've always just been like lucky. Have you ever had a hardship? Of course. Well, we all a have challenge? hardships, but you know, like there's a lot, even a lot of hardships going through radio. You, you meet people that it's hard to get along with them or you have to dig deep in yourself and say, okay, like mm -hmm. we are all different personalities and maybe I don't, I, you know, my job up north, I didn't mesh with my co-host and it felt like days were years, mm. but you push through it because you're- But have you ever had someone, like maybe not this co-host, but somebody that you felt was working against you to, to- So when I first started, when I went to go do radio up north, my boss who originally set me up there mm -hmm. called me and told me, because we had had a flub on, a sh on one of our shows, and she told me, you will never make it in radio. You will never make it in radio. And she could have crushed my dreams right then and there because I really looked up to her. Uh, did you cry? No. I. What I did is I remembered the messaging that my parents told me mm. of growing up. And mm -hmm. that's you can be and do anything you want. Mm. And so it invigorated me. It actually made me so mad that you I had went. had to prove her wrong. I had to prove her wrong. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to allow someone to tell me who I was. And so that's when I sent my air check to power. Wow. Yeah. 
So how do you, how, like for the person that wants to find that fuel inside of them and not be crushed by a person like that, maybe someone who, the, who was told the same thing but didn't have the support team from the family unit, because that happens a lot. Absolutely. Well, how does that person find that? Like what, is it just, you have to be born with it? Or what would no. you recommend? That's what Wordiful is all about. It's the power of your words. It's creating, because even though I was raised with great parents who spoke incredibly loving to me, mm -hmm. we still have that inner critic that is so mean to us and oh. that tells us we Ooh. can't do it, we're not worth it. And, you know. Self-invalidation. Invalidation, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just tearing ourselves apart, especially as women. And, and it's not our fault. We get fed so much information and imagery of what perfect looks like or what confidence looks like or you need this to be happy you need that to be happy that we lose ourselves and we forget what it truly is to feel self-love mm -hmm. because we don't look like the television or the movies or the things yeah, that the magazines filters the filters or yeah or just growing up i remember having 17 magazine and looking nothing like the girls in 17 mm -hmm. magazine i remember that and thank god i had three older sisters that all looked so different that I had to redefine what beauty was. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time mm -hmm. because, you know, I, I definitely suffered from like ugly duckling syndrome when I was young. I think we all do going through our adolescence yeah, I and had teens. Some issues. I was a very yeah. late developer, yeah. yeah. And so I think Do you think men have that? I mean, this is just a quick side I'm note. Sure but they, do you think I they think have they the self-invalidation thing? Or sure, you just think sure, because men develop different too. Body image, they don't mm -hmm. talk about it. Mm -hmm. We're women, we talk about mm -hmm. it. And that's, the, that's essentially what I'm trying to grow with these communities. The more we talk about it, mm -hmm. the more we, under, we don't feel so isolated and alone. You know, sometimes I say, I wish as women we could sit in like a group of us just naked and, under, and talk about- Oh God, my and, worst fear. Exactly, that's oh! why. It is our worst fear. But when we see that other women are struggling with the same body image problems that we are struggling with, it just makes you, it normalizes it. It's like this sense of relief, like, oh, your boobs aren't the same size either? Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> True. Like, it's, you know, it's just, or you have cellulite too, okay, but that doesn't make me more or less valuable, mm -hmm. you know? No, yeah, no, I totally understand. Um, you know, I've, I've worked so hard to overcome so many of that self-invalidation thing that I had, especially back in LA, back in the day when I was being an actress and a model and, and so much. And that's a tough world. It's a tough world, especially because everything is centered on the way you look. Exactly, So yeah, exactly. Like and somebody very... else's no, but you internalize that as rejection. Right, you, know? you didn't get this, you're too tall, you're too short, you're, I can't you're not blind, you're not red, right. you're, you're, you know, you're not Latina, you're too, you know, like whatever. Yeah. You know, whatever the thing was. When I first got into radio, they told me I didn't sound Latin enough. They oh, asked geez. me if I could sound more Latin, and I was like, look at my skin. Look at, I am, I am Latina, like what are you talking about? Because yeah. I was raised in Riverside or right. because my parents gave me a proper education, yeah. you want me to downplay who I am? Yeah. Like no way, mm -hmm. no way. No. But you know, I don't wanna all uh, give all the credit to luck because I don't think it's that. I think it's preparation meets opportunity. Yeah, and that's and what they say and luck is. And it's work is. ethic. That is what luck is. Yeah, that is what luck is. Okay, so now I'm going back in the story. At some point, you get the access, the access Hollywood gig. So I'm now getting experience from MTV. Mm -hmm. And after MTV gig is up, uh, I did a lottery show. It was California Lottery. And it you was, picked the balls? I didn't pick the balls. It was a game <laughs> show. Like, it was a you? game show where people that won for the big spin. So ah, they would come on, okay. and I was like the Vanna Brown. Ah, I would not the Vanna White, the but the Vanna, Vanna Brown. Brown. I would walk around the car, and we would give do different prizes. But what I loved about that experience, and this was hard hours, we would start filming at seven a.m. and wouldn't wrap till seven p.m. because wow. we would do yep. show after show after show. Mm -hmm. So they would have so many so in much the can. Energy you have to produce. But what I loved about that experience, I became a pro at reading from the teleprompter because I had such a, a phobia mm. of the words are moving on the screen and what if I mess up yes. and this is being filmed and oh my God. And, and they, they say, practice makes perfect. It does. So I began to practice. So then when E! News called, E! News called me before Access Hollywood. E! News came calling and I took the audition. 
I did well because why? I had prompter experience. I could let my personality shine, mm -hmm. not be intimidated by a telephone, make it my own. Yep. And I took it very seriously. Mm -hmm. And so when I was ready to leave radio, my first step is I left to E! News. So E! News, now you're interviewing celebrities. So now I'm, I'm partly doing, so there was E! News and they had a, um, another show called E! News Now where the videos lived online. Mm. And that was where I was at. But sometimes they would bring me into the E! News room where I would report on the big news. It was more, I think, intimidating to walk in. If you felt like, I felt like I got recruited from the minors to play with the major leagues. And it was Ryan Seacrest, Juliana wow, Rancic. Wow. And you have to go stand in the middle of them and do the news. And, and I, were they? They were so great. Okay. They were so great. They were gracious. cool. They well, made Ryan you feel knew relaxed. me because of radio. Okay. So he had, That's good. he had a lot of respect for me, friends. which was really great. And Juliana was very warm and inviting. Mm. And they just made me feel like I belonged. Mm -hmm. And so it was really great. Like the first day I got there, she was like, so are you dating any? Yeah, she, yeah, just, she just yeah, just write a girlfriend talk. Yeah. yeah. I like her. And yeah, she's great. Yeah. She's great. From what I see on TV, yeah. I don't know her. No, she was yeah. always very gracious with yeah. me. Um, and then more time went on and they would put me on E! News more and more and more. And the bosses upstairs really liked me and their sister station. So it's all NBC Universal. Mm -hmm. So okay. when I was done with my E! News contract, that's when they pushed me over to go audition for Access. And that's where you did your red carpet interviews. And that's where I did all my red carpet interviews. And now let me ask you this. On the red carpet, when you interview whoever, a celebrity, do does the celebrity know they're going to be interviewed by you? Or are you trying to get them in on the interview? It depends. You know, it depends what event it is. A lot of times people do want to do the interviews because they want to promote something. Of course. Which is, you know, a benefit to both people. Mm -hmm. uh, but, my, you know, my first interview at Access Hollywood was Sylvester Stallone. Get out! <laughs> yeah. oh, my very so first, cool. my first day was on the he, job. Was he cool? He was so nice. Yeah, he, he was, was so nice. I'm, yeah, I thought so too. And I was really fortunate because of all my years in radio, 10 years, we had interviewed every celebrity under the sun. Oh, because you had all the, the musicians sun. come musicians, in. Musicians. Oh, you did, uh, you did, you did like movie everybody. stars too. Oh, yeah, everybody. Wow. Yeah, okay, everybody. so by that time, the nerves were So when they off. saw me, it was, how are you? Not like, nice to meet you, mm. which was really great. Mm. And I was really trusted by the music industry. Mm -hmm. So that felt really good, because every time I walked in to do a music interview, it was like seeing an old friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that is so cool, yeah. man. So you're interviewing people, so you don't feel like... There was anyone ever rude to you? Did any? You don't have to say a name, but did not, anyone ever not, shun you? Well, or here's did the you thing. ever have to report on a story that like that was gossipy? And sure, then feel of course, back? of course. You know, my I was very self aware. I've always been self aware, mm -hmm. and because my like I said, going back to the self talk of how I talk to myself, how my parents have taught me to talk to myself. Because they say. The voice we use to punish ourselves and the voice we use to love ourselves tends to be our parents' voice. Oh, wow. And so I would never make myself less than when I walked into an interview. It was never like, you're so and so, therefore I'm less, I'm less, mm, good. like, I'm, my worth doesn't go down because mm. you are so and so. Right. It's like, I'm, you, you, I'm here to do a job and hope. So you never got intimidated? I, not really. That is brilliant. Not really. Unless okay, someone, but say that, and say that because I want them to hear the rest of that. Like, you would never disparage yourself or lower your value. My value never went value down no matter who was in the somebody. room. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Because I feel like the minute you do that, it's kind of like um, they, the way they say bees can smell fear or mm -hmm. animals can mm -hmm. smell fear. Mm -hmm. I feel like we can smell fear. Mm -hmm. So if you walk into the room and you're timid and you're feeling like you're so, I'm so yes, worthy, yes, you know, I'm unworthy like, to be yes, here. Yeah. No. No, because then you're taken away from the job you're there to do. And have you always had the ability to disarm women or people in general? Like, because you're very warm. From the moment I met you, you, you're very, you know how to grant um, power or beingness to somebody. You know what I mean? Like, you feel very comfortable in your space just from the get-go. Thank you. Do you think that's, A, helped you be as successful as you are? 100%. Because even as you said it, it's completely resonated. I was like, that's what every producer would tell me. Yeah. They're like, you make people feel so comfortable. Yeah. And I think that has a lot to do with being comfortable in your own skin. Mm -hmm. The more comfortable you are, the more comfortable someone else is mm -hmm. going to be. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm fidgeting and I'm sizing you up because I don't feel worthy, mm -hmm. then that's going to make you feel some kind of way. Yeah. Because energy is like, felt everywhere yes, we go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure.
Well, that's awesome. All right, I want to know about this thing, Wordiful. So now you're doing Access Hollywood, <laughs> and then, am I correct on this? You leave Access Hollywood. So the way the stars aligned, and it's bittersweet, you know, my first month there, my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Oh, no. And I went to my boss who had hired me, and I told her, I said, I think I'm going to have to quit because I was going to care for my mom. Wow. And she said... I was hearing it from both her and my father. My father was like, no way, you're not quitting. Like, you did not work this hard. We did not, like, mm -hmm. you went through schooling. Mm -hmm. You did mm -hmm. all this time in radio. Like, you've, you're you here now. Right. Your mom would not want this for you. No, I agree. And then the woman I spoke to who hired me, she said, as a mother, I don't think your mother would want this for That's you. Right. And I just kept hearing that. And she said, look, we're here to support you. If you need to take a week, you need to take a month, we're going to support that. Wow. But don't quit your job. So I said, okay. So I moved my mom to Los Angeles. And every day you I was... Your mom and dad were together? Yeah, my mom and dad were oh, together. So you moved but both of them or just no, the mom? No, 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 just my mom. Because, okay. you know, with Alzheimer's in the beginning when my mom had just dementia, mm -hmm. it was very hard on my dad. You mm. know, my mother, she, you know, you're not in your right mind. Oh, I can imagine. You become yeah. very accusatory. It was everything from you're stealing my jewelry to you're stealing my car keys to are you having an affair? Are you do? And by the time my mom was actually diagnosed... My dad was just, he felt kicked, you know, no, poor thing. He yeah. was, he was just he so, was tired. he had so much anxiety mm. over it. You mm. know, he, he was heartbroken too. Mm -hmm. This was his wife. Yeah. And so I just told my dad, let me care for her. Let me take her. And just, I felt my dad needed to, to recover. Yeah. He needed to recover from what was happening. And my dad's very old school Latino. Like he didn't understand what that disease was. He kept asking like, is she going to get better? Is she going to mm. get better? And he mm. just assumed, like, if we went to the right doctors, her memory would just come back. Mm. And he didn't understand that yeah. it's degressive, you know? Right. So uh, my mom came to L.A. with me, and uh, I cared, was caring for her, and I had a caregiver as well, this wonderful woman that helped me. But that was my life for the first couple years, was going to work, running home, being with my mom, getting up early, going to see my mom, going to work, going. And it was great because I, I lived so close to work that it... it was somewhat functional, but at the same time, I was I dropped like ten pounds and my hair was falling out, and oh. I didn't realize the stress of you don't realize the stress of it because you're every day you're in like deep heartbreak. Mm -hmm. because did she ever forget who you were? Was, did it, was of course, it, yeah, did. yeah, okay. of course. Uh, I don't say of course in a. I just no, no, no. It's but part of the, yeah, part I of what happened. What stage? Because yeah. my father had he passed away now, but he he was diagnosed with dementia. But I don't think it ever went into full on Alzheimer's. Like he never forgot who I was. Mm, I just great. remember this one story where I was pregnant with my first child, Sabrina, and of course I had been married to my husband for six years. And my, I was like, I can't wait to, to tell Pops. I call him Pops. And she was like trying to prep me on the phone. And she was like, I just, if he has a reaction or whatever. And I was like, Mom, like, are you nuts? You know, like, stop it. Like, you know, but she was trying to prepare me yeah. for the moment. Like I told him, I was like, Dad, you know, I didn't call him Dad. I was like, Pops. I'm pregnant. And he goes, what? What? Who's the father? Who's the father? Like, he was, <laughs> it was as if I, I was laugh because I can relate to that. 15 years old. Right. And he thought I was like with some guy. I was like, dad, I, right. I don't know why I say dad. because You have to, and that's the sweetness. But I was like, of, it's uh, great. You have to, We've been married right. six years. This is a good thing. We've been trying really hard. Oh, 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 oh okay. You know, but yes. Yeah, so. You have to, you have to laugh. If not, you'll cry. Yeah. I, was, I, had, I was laughing so hard because it was my mom, my sister, and I on the, the three-way conversation. And when it happened, it was such a release of just nervousness yeah. or whatever it was. But my mom and I were laughing so hard, we were snorting. Oh because my God. I was making her so wrong for preparing me for the moment. My sister had to, like, actually explain what was really going on while my mom and I were just dying laughing. Which, is, I know it's not funny, but no. in certain moments. I've had so many of those instances where I was hanging out with my mom. We had spent the whole day together. And I'm thinking, oh, this is so great. We're just making so many memories. And she leans in and she grabs my hand and she's like, I want you to meet my daughter. She lives in LA too. And I think you guys would get along so well. And I'm just looking at her like, I am your daughter. But it was also very beautiful because I thought, wow, she if she met me today, mm -hmm. she would like me. She would love me. Yeah. Wow, oh, that's, a, that's a beautiful story. And yeah. I, have a, I have a lot that I can relate to when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so how do you get to Wordiful? Now you leave Access Hollywood. So no, so Wordiful actually started in transition. So how did you get the idea? Uh, it was a very collaborative effort. So at the time, I was in a relationship, and I was. Was this with the high school sweetheart? No, 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 no. Okay. So my high school sweetheart I dated for ten years. We we broke up when I was at Power. Okay. And uh, we're still very good friends till this day, actually. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I was at now at Access, and I was telling my other half at the time, I said, I am yearning for that relationship I had with Los Angeles in radio. Mm -hmm. I'm telling stories, but it's stories I don't care about, mm -hmm. and there's no one talking back to me. Mm -hmm. Like, when I was in radio, you, I, I, it was when I broke up with my high school sweetheart, I cried on the air. Because Big was just, I mean, they were so funny, you know. They would put all these, like, really sad, slow songs on and just try to make me sob in my chair. And that they, is so mean. It's so mean. They, it was like Big Brothers. That's what it was. Oh we were a family. Oh, my gosh. And so, you know, and my dad, uh, in what, a year I was there, was got uh, diagnosed with cancer. No. Yeah, so you're going through all these really fun events, like Laker parades. And, and you're supposed to be happy, but and inside you're, you're... No, and you're having a good time, but then... Life really happens too, right, and all right. these other things are happening. So when people would come up to me on the street, it was never, oh my gosh, I remember when you guys had Jennifer Lopez on, or oh my gosh, I remember when Eminem came to visit mm, the neighborhood. Mm, it mm. was always, oh my God, I remember when Big made you cry on the air. Because they could relate to that emotion. Mm -hmm. And I just missed that. I missed the connection. The connection. The deepness. The deepness, the storytelling. This, yeah. This passion to help. You've been wanting Very to much. Help. Very much. Yeah. And so I would t tell my person that. And one, I think it was like in the middle of the night. And we, you know, I was always a, talking about the power of words. I loved mm -hmm. The Four Agreements with Don Miguel Ruiz. Like that book changed my life. And yeah, I would I talk about it all yeah. the time with okay. him. And he woke me up and he says, I know what you're going to do. He says, I have this idea. And then we collaborated on what it was going to be. And out came Wordiful. And so Wordiful is a show. Wordiful is an online video series okay. about the power of words. So it's 60 second videos that talk about. That's it? 60 second 60 videos? 60 second videos, yeah. They're That's very it? digestible, yeah. Okay, so 60 second videos that do what? So I'll take one word mm -hmm. and I'll talk about the power of this word, what this word has taught me, how I'm growing from this word, how this word is currently affecting me. And I mean, it's crazy. This went from being a passion project to, I, I call it my confessional. Mm. My church, my therapy, and my home. And this passion project, which has become my purpose, has like saved me. Words are powerful and we can't take them back. So we must think before we speak. Why has it saved you and how do you pick your words? It's whatever season I'm in. So we just released a video today and the word is abandoned. You know, my mother's health is declining and I had that huge realization that... Um, I probably don't have as much time as I would like, and mm -hmm. I get very sentimental yeah. talking about it, but I felt this enormous hole, this sense of abandonment of not my yes. mom's fault, but, I know, but who am, who, what is my place in the world without her? Mm. And you know, when my mom was first diagnosed, my, I was in a relationship. So when I would feel fear, feel sadness, I would be able to, I was able to come home and nuzzle in this person or, explain to them what I was feeling or mm -hmm. express my fears. And now I'm on my own again, so I come home and there's nobody there. So I felt doubly abandoned. Yeah. I thought, there's no one here to comfort me and my mother's gonna be gone. Oh my God, I'm alone. But again, I, what I had realized was I was abandoning myself. Mm, I was not being powerful. thoughtful with my words and my thoughts and I was creating this big bubble of fear mm. when I could be leaning so much on gratitude, on just being grateful that I've had my mother for 74 years, that I had this beautiful relationship who is still there for me as a friend. Mm. So that's what the word abandon, it sometimes sounds so negative, yes, but it's, it does. It's, such a, it's such a beautiful word if you realize that you never want to abandon your gratitude. You never want to abandon yourself. You never want to abandon those positive thoughts, even in those dark times, because that is what is going to mm. help you bounce back a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So you, you, do you always put a positive spin on a word, or is it unique to the word? 
I try to because we'll I, be I, believe to there, I, I believe there is a, a positivity in any, it's all perspective, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a friend of mine told me there's two types of, there's two types of people you can be. There's the person who walks in faith as, and says to, my, says to themselves, today is going to be a great day. I expect great things to happen. Life is only going to get better. This is the first day of the rest of my life, and it's going to play out so well. And then there's the person in fear who says, oh, I've already had the best years of my life. I can only expect there to get worse. Mm -hmm. I'm going to age. I'm going to this. I'm mm -hmm. going to that. Mm -hmm. And you can't see fear. You can't see faith. But you still get to make the choice, right? And I have another good friend who says, Faith is like Wi-Fi, like you can't see it, but you need it to be connected. Oh. So I try to put all those things in perspective when I pick my word because there's always a silver lining, mm -hmm. always. There's always a lesson to be learned, right? Yeah, oh, for sure, with everything. With everything. So, but you interview people on Word Wordiful. So I have guests, I have guests. But how do you do that in 60 seconds? So it's usually, it's I mean, it, 60 seconds? it can run to like a minute, thir never over a minute 30. Uh, so basically, if you came on to be a guest, which mm -hmm. I would love to have you, oh, you great. would choose your word, Ooh. whatever season you're in. And you mean season, whatever season I'm in, like whatever's happening for yeah, me at the time. Yeah, maybe okay. you're dealing with, like, yes. what, if, I, if I told you to choose a word right now, what's something that you're dealing with in life right now? Oh, my God. Where's the list? <laughs> um, I'm dealing with, uh, God, there's so many. I could take the word treason. I could, or betrayal. Okay, so let's do the word betrayal because I feel like that's so relatable. Okay. So you would write or you would talk about for 60 seconds what, what you've learned from betrayal, mm -hmm. what betrayal makes you feel, mm -hmm. and what at the end of the day, what, what's the one thing you take away from it? You want me to? Answer it. Okay, I, I think okay, it's, okay. I get so, so excited so, when okay. someone else does a word. I'm like, whoa, oh, okay. Yeah. And we're doing the wordiful. <laughs> this is a live demonstration here. Okay, so betrayal. At first, when the betrayal, and I've had several. Um, so what did it make you feel? Well, it made me feel gut-wrenched, and it made me want to cut off and close off from the world and say, I'm giving so much, like, for what? Like, because I'm so open and so vulnerable. And then I realized if I did that, then the enemy or who I perceived as an enemy wins because then I withdraw me from the world and my greatness and what I do have to offer. So the word betrayal then became how I used that fuel to say, no, I'm going to be better than, I'm going to help even more people, I'm going to make even more of a difference, and I'm going to flourish and prosper and win in the face of betrayal. And you probably attracted even more blessings to yourself. A million percent. Because what it did for me is, at first, I'm not going to lie, the betrayal, the, that thing came out as an antagonistic thing to get sure. back at them. But what quickly happened is because I did so much and started helping so many people and making a difference and rising to the occasion and stretching myself as a, as a spiritual being, all of a sudden, the, the focus came so far off of that, I was fulfilled here, and ironically over here, it helped me to understand where they came from. It wasn't right, but I understand why it happened. I understand the experiences that they've had that made them into that jaded or that whatever that would do that to me. Comes from their wounds. Yeah, and so I no longer have that initial... Victimization. Uh, yeah, that that, or that revenge yes like I literally don't wish revenge on them anymore by doing something in a positive creative way that was initially out of revenge actually was my salvation there's your episode yeah <laughs> yes let's do it wrap it up no but, um, but that's but I love that. but that's essentially how I create every word is looking at what it taught me mm -hmm. where it pained me yeah and then the growth mm-hmm well, I've loved having you on the show. I'm going to ask you one last question. Yes. Um, do you, I'm going to ask you a couple because yes. now I've got inspired again. Do yes. you consider yourself a woman in power? Absolutely. Okay. And what would a woman in power, what does that look like to you? You know, even bigger, as soon as you said it, it's, a, it's not just a woman, it's a human in power. Mm -hmm. Because I don't, I, of course I want to be able to empower women because I feel like we need it so much. Mm -hmm. But... What I do 
I don't even want to say what I do, what we do when we empower each other, then we go out into the world and we empower the men around us as well. Absolutely, love that. And it comes back tenfold to us because when we empower the men around us, Mm -hmm. when we're able to stand as women in our own power, Mm -hmm. we don't allow other people to mistreat us or talk to us a certain way, Mm -hmm. or we show that we are equal. And when other people understand that we are equal and we are there to help, we get that energy back. I always Mm. say energy can't be destroyed, it can only be transformed. So really what I'm trying to do is transform the energy that women feel within themselves so they can then go out and do it for other people as well. I love that. How does a woman who doesn't feel like they have that, how do they get that? There are so many teachables, uh, teachable takeaways that women can start applying into their lives. This is a lot of what I teach uh, at the Wordiful events. Uh, I write in a gratitude journal every day, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure everyone's heard of that, but to understand why, why women do this or why pe- individuals do this. So every time that you have a thought of gratitude or a thought in general, a synapsis in your brain goes off and it moves to the other side to connect with another synapsis. So the brain likes to conserve energy. So if you're having the same thought over and over again, like a complaint. Mm. Like what, men are jerks. Would that whatever, be a yeah, you can, you know, or you can be in traffic and, and you're like, ah, I'm in traffic, this sucks, this is the car in front of me, and this, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. you're just complaining, complaining, complain. and all of a sudden it's, it's on a loop. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, the reason mm-hmm. it's on a loop mm. is because the brain likes to conserve energy. And it's like, instead of traveling to the other side of my brain, I'm going to reel in this other synapsis. You rewire your brain so she can have the thought easier. And this, so if I'm a complainer, I'm going to start complaining all the time because I'm a rewiring. complainer at the gym. So because I'm rewiring my brain. But if I practice thoughts of gratitude, guess what happens? It makes it that much easier when something bad happens for me to bounce back with gratitude because I've trained that muscle. Yeah. So that's why I write them every single day. And that's that, that's a one that's one. That's step, one, one way is, is to mm-hmm. start looking at what you have as opposed to what you don't have. Oh, I love that. Because you can't be grateful for more mm-hmm. if you're not already grateful for what you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, another thing I do is I write seven affirmations every day because I give direction to my life. Mm-hmm. Because without direction, we're sleepwalking, right? Sure, you gotta have a target. You gotta have a target, you gotta have goals. So mm-hmm. I write one for my mind, my body, my soul, wow. my family, mm-hmm. my social, my slash relationship, my work and my money. And what do you do if you fail at one of those? You said you were gonna do X and you don't do it. Do you- it's not about doing it, it's about where do I want to be. So when I wake up, I write, uh, my mind is healthy, my mind is at ease, my mind is joyful, my mind is forgiving, my mind is productive. Uh, whatever I want to feel that day. Mm-hmm. And I don't make it so it's automatic, because if it's automatic, yeah, then, then... it goes to the thing. It right. goes on the loop. It goes in uh-huh. the loop. And then I be, I'm very deliberate with how I want to feel that day. Mm-hmm. Then I write one for my body. My body is energetic. My body is in its best shape. My body, and, and it's interesting, because I've been at the gym where I've been jump roping, and I get so tired. Oh, I know. And all of a sudden, that affirmation comes in. My body is energetic. My body is healthy. My body is strong. And all of a sudden... And all of a sudden, I have a second wind. Because again, it is the power of the word. Repeti- the mind, that's how the brain. The- that's how the brain learns mm-hmm. is through repetition. Mm-hmm. Anything you do, think about brushing your teeth or driving home. You've learned that through repetition. Well, the same thing can happen with our thoughts. If we've learned to talk so negatively mm. to ourselves, mm. Mm. that is through repetition. The same way, you know, people think that it's fooey, whatever word you want to call it, to stand in the mirror and look at yourself and say, I love you, I got your back. Oh, yeah. You do that every single so day. Do you do that? One, yeah, absolutely. Every day you do One that? day oh, you're going to wake up and believe it. I promise you. Wow. I promise you. Because when I first started doing it, it was super awkward and I was it's like, so awkward. this is so weird. But who cares? And I feel a little, yeah, just... I can't even put into words what I felt the first couple of days. You're like, this is I could ridiculous. even almost like make eye contact with myself in the mirror. Wow, that's interesting. And probably I would say like a month in, 30 days later, You're like, eh. I now I look forward to it. When I'm brushing my teeth, I smile at myself because I'm like, wow, I really have my that own is back. Amazing. I have my own back. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, so there's those two. It's gratitude journaling, affirmations, and I'm a huge advocate of meditation. Because sometimes we seek all the answers outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I say, nobody else has downloaded your whole life. You have. I agree with that. You've lived every experience, every interaction you've had, every heartbreak you've had. Only you've experienced that. So you're the only person that knows what is best for you. I agree with that. So many people try to ask other people. And and they're going to give you their opinions from their their side. Their experience. And what they think. Not from what you, only you know the answer to you. Sometimes... I feel like people go to the outside source so that they, don't they trust can themselves. blame that they have a, an scapegoat. 
Well, because they, I, you know what I'm saying? Rather than just, sure. look, if I'm wrong, I'm going down wrong. I really, you know? Yeah, and, and that, I'm sure there's layers to it. Yeah. But the biggest thing is we don't trust ourselves. Mm -hmm. We don't exactly. trust that. You know, we say, oh, that person's a spiritual leader. Oh, that person's a teacher. Oh, I'm going to go to my church. I'm going to go do this. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's great to have those tools, but nobody knows you better than you. And Million you can't agree. hear that, that voice. You can't mm -hmm. hear that higher self unless you get quiet. I don't, I don't know about that part, but but I do know what you mean about no one knows you better than you. Yeah. 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 And I, I, for me, I've learned so much more about myself through meditation, mm -hmm. through getting quiet, because yeah. I believe prayer is our request going out, our thank yous going out, and meditation is the answers coming in. And so, what happens when you meditate? You you you. What do you do? Uh, so I do uh, TM. And I transcendent, trans, transcendental meditation. Mm -hmm. And basically, you get a mantra. You're not supposed to tell anyone your mantra. You, oh, you get okay, a mantra, okay. and then you go. It, so the mantra is only there. You make there. up your own mantra. No, the, when you go, I took a class, and they okay. give you a mantra. Mm -hmm. And the only reason you have a mantra is so that you're basically saying in repetition in your mind so that you can clear out your thoughts. You're going to have thoughts regardless. But it's just also monitoring, like, and so then what, what, when you clear your thoughts and you get the concept, that comes from something else, like God, or that comes from you? It depends what you believe in. I believe that I'm super interconnected with my creator. Mm -hmm. And so it's leaving the outside realm, leaving this outside, you know, we're mm -hmm. so visually stimulated all the time. Mm -hmm. But when I go inside, I'm able to actually hear my soul. Mm -hmm. I'm actually able to tap into yeah. the things I need to tap into. Mm -hmm. And figure it out. Yeah. So it's been very successful oh, for you. Oh, it's uh, yeah. loads of inspiration. That's where I get some of my greatest ideas. Do you ever get headaches? No. From doing that? No. No? Okay. No. I, okay. I have felt extreme bliss, though. You mm -hmm. know, when I first took the class, they, were, they told me, you're going to feel just happy for no reason. Like, just randomly, you're just going to feel happy. And I was like, wait, what? okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then when I was doing it religiously, I mean, when I first started, I was doing it 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon. And one day I was playing with my dog and I was smiling so hard, my face hurt. And I just felt this, oh, like this wave over me of just bliss. There's no other way to explain it. I thought, oh my God, this is what they're talking about. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Yeah. I feel a lot more centered in my life. Mm -hmm. And it's the only thing that's proven to grow your hypothalamus. Hypo who? Hypothalamus. It's What's what a hypothalamus? It, your hypothalamus is a part of the brain which you preserve all your memories. Oh, and your thinking. Wow. Yeah. Well, well, when we yeah. lose that, okay. that's, so you do you have a good memory? I, when I meditate, I do. I have an excellent memory, and that's one thing I notice too. Is like you know, a lot of times we forget where we put the car keys. Yeah, we walk you? out the door and we we forget. Oh, I forgot to bring this. Yeah, when yeah. I'm in, when I'm when you're in your zone. When I am. Um, very like strict with my meditation when I'm doing it every single day, I'm sharp. I'm so sharp. That's so cool. And I have so much more, much more inspiration, yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, sharing thank your you. story, going so deep and being so real. And yeah. um, I'm, I'm so honored to have you. Thank and, you. And it was so great to it's meet so you. It's so nice to, to meet you. To finally. meet the yeah. voice that I've listened to for thank so you. long. It was really great having you on the show. No, thank, thank you. you for being so welcoming. I do Aww, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Yay. <laughs> Yay.